huge welcome to a virtual nay throw. And uh, we hope that we will have these talks back in our shul, probably on a hybrid system. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all today. The evening will commence, as has been our, our minhag, with Malcolm Cohen lighting a memorial candle on behalf of us all and then reciting Kael Mole Rachamim. Malcolm. Mole Rahamim Dayan Amonois Vaviso Emim Alno Sereche Visisa Pak Ledam Israel Shenish Pak Kamohim Hametse Menu Honeho Al Kanfe Ashpino Malos Kudoshim Utiorim Kuzoya Roki Amirim Masirim Estish Moisayem Shall be the voice of Faith Rowell. Yanoshim, Noshim, Yelodim, Vilodois, Shenergo, Venish Hatu, Venish Refu, Venechnaku, Venik Baruchayim, Guarotso, no Kulo kidoishim utayom oibim Uboem giyom oibim etzadim Arishadonon adirei atzoibro Beganei dertiei menuchosom Lochayina balorachamim Yasti reim b'sei sekeno v'fav li'oi lomim V'yitro b'yitro achayim es tishmo sovom Adunoi v'nachal osom V'yonuchu v'sholom al mishkovom V'naymar omein Malcolm, thank you very much. Can I ask, ladies and gentlemen, before I introduce Mr. Goldberg, if you would kindly mute yourselves so that uh, there is no interference during Mr. Goldberg's uh, talk, just to give you a set out of how the evening will proceed. Mr. Goldberg will speak for about one hour and he has kindly agreed to take questions um, to all those, and now two, over 200 participants on this Zoom. Mm -hmm. Once again, welcome you, welcome our many members and friends, and also it's a tribute to Mr. Goldberg that there are many people on the Zoom from his shul, Hendon Adas, and many of his friends and neighbours. So you're very welcome, and you're welcome to participate and ask questions after Mr. Goldberg's presentation. By way of brief introduction, Mr. Goldberg was born in 1930 in Germany. In 1941, at the age of 11, he and his younger brother Hermann age seven and the mother were deported to a ghetto. Mr. Goldberg spent three and a half years in various labor and concentration camps, which he will detail. And he was liberated by British troops on the 3rd of May, 1945. He arrived in the United Kingdom in September, 1946 with his mother to be, re to be reunited with his father and has lived in this country since then, is married with children and grandchildren. Mr. Goldberg is frequently featured by broadcast and print media and recounted and has recounted what he has endured to all strata of society from royalty, civil servants to school children and does so eloquently and movingly. As you hear Mr. Goldberg speak and you will know that Mr. Goldberg has spoken many times, 
please bear in mind for Mr. Goldberg and for many Holocaust survivors who bravely recount what they endured, it is not an easy thing for them to do because they relive their gruesome experiences by recounting it. So we are enormously grateful to you, Mr. Goldberg, and um, the floor is yours. I just have to work out to, um, can you, um, to unmute you. Mr. Goldberg, can you unmute yourself, Mr. Goldberg? Mr. Goldberg, you're unmuted now. Right, I've unmuted myself. Ladies and gentlemen, in my talk tonight, I will attempt to give you an insight into what the term Holocaust actually meant to us who experienced it. In other words, give you a little glimpse of what actually transpired in these hundreds of camps the Nazis had established. But before I do, I would like to spend a couple of minutes just dispelling um, a misapprehension which I have become aware of through feedback from, from previous talks. And this is directed primarily at the younger generation who have grown up in a different climate to what it was back in the 1930s. As soon as the Nazis gained power in 1933, began an unending stream of anti-Jewish legislation. Laws were passed by the dozen, depriving Jews of freedom in degrees. And this was done publicly the world was well aware of what was happening and it gained momentum over the years. Nevertheless, the majority of countries kept their borders tightly shut. A few of the more merciful ones um, had annual quotas of visas, but most of them um, imposed such difficulties, so many hoops one had to jump through to qualify for one of these precious visas, that the result was a very slow immigration. It made no impact on the world, but after years, um, countries like the USA began to be criticized for not doing more to help Jews. And President Roosevelt actually um, called a conference called the Evian Conference in 1938. The reason I'm speaking about this is because many younger people feel that the German Jews or Jews in Germany did not take their situation seriously enough. Otherwise, by the beginning of the war, most of them would have left Germany. And I'm trying to make it clear to you that people were desperate to leave, but there was just nowhere to go. In fact, many Jews became so desperate to flee Germany that they paid substantial sums to professional smugglers to guide them over the land borders into adjoining countries like France, Belgium, or Holland, where they felt they would be safe. Unfortunately, we all know that these countries were eventually occupied by the Nazis, and the majority of these Jews who mistakenly thought they were safe were in fact rounded up and sent to death camps. This Evian conference was called by President Roosevelt, and people feel it was called primarily um, to deflect criticism from America. So 32 countries met and had a conference. The new the meditation. Oh, someone uh, muted me again. They, they, they discussed for around two weeks how to help um, Jews escape, flee to safety. Well, the conference initially showed sympathy because the Nazis had said they'll allow Jews to leave. 
But then these various representatives of these countries realized that the Nazis would allow Jews to leave, but not until they had stripped them of all their material possessions. In other words, Jews would arrive penniless, um, their enthusiasm began to wane, and the end result was that the conference was a complete failure. And I believe that this um, blatant exhibition of indifference to the Jewish fate of Jew, the, Jew, the fate of Jews in Germany encouraged Hitler, and he felt it gave him the green light to proceed with building his extermination machine. And the first sign of this happened only a few months later, on the 9th of November, there was an event which is called Kristallnacht, or the Night of the Broken Glass. And the Nazis had organized a nationwide orgy of attacks on Jewish property, thousands of shops, Jewish run shops, which had not been expropriated yet, although many, many had. I believe by 1938, something like two thirds of Jewish businesses <clears throat> had been taken over by the Nazis, expropriated from their Jewish owners. But the few that remained were vandalized and looted on that 9th of November night. Jews who they met in the street were attacked. Several pe Jewish people were killed during that night. Hundreds of synagogues were ransacked. Holy books, including Sifri Torah, were torn up. And larger shoes, <coughs> which stood in their own grounds, were set on fire. Many um, historians believe that, in effect, that night was the beginning of the actual Holocaust. We actually saw one sh the flames from one shul from our window. The vast majority of Jewish people living in Kassel, our town, um, were fairly assimilated. And the shul I'm speaking about was not far from our home. And it was a sort of reform shul, which was not attended by any religious Jews. But nevertheless, as far as the Germans, the Nazis were concerned, it was a synagogue. And of course, they set it on fire and it ended up as a heap of rubble. It's was literally almost impossible to obtain visas. My, pa my father came to Germany in 1917, after having several times managed to postpone his call up into the Polish army, then it was no longer possible to stall. Um, he was in yeshiva at the time, had been there for three years. He was only 17 now. He went to Yeshiva aged 14. He decided he had to do the only thing possible, and that is to pack his peckle and disappear. He made his way to Germany. He wasn't the first young man to do it. And I think he chose Castle because one or two people he knew had ended up in that same town. He settled in Castle and after some years, he was introduced to a young lady from an Orthodox Polish home, and they married in 1927. This lady was fated to become my mother, Olea Sholem. And I was born there in Kassel in 1930, my brother in 1934. After living in Germany for more than 20 years, my father was arrested in mid-1939, and together with a group of around 25 men, they were deported to Poland. Although my father had renounced his Polish nationality once he had settled in Germany, the Poles refused to accept these people, sent them back to Germany, and it developed into a sort of football game. They were no longer sent by train, but at night they had to walk through a wood into the Polish border. The Poles picked them up, turned them around, walked them back, until one day 
The Pearl said, if you turn up again, we'll shoot you instead of sending you back. They then split into smaller groups and managed to evade the German patrols as they entered Germany. My father went into hiding, um, sent word. He hid with, with the help of a cousin who lived in Berlin, who was afraid to have him in his home. He dumped in a stiebel. He took my father to the stiebel, got permission for him to sleep there, and his cousin brought him food. My mother courageously pleaded with the Germans to allow my father his freedom, but they said the only alternative to his being sent to a concentration camp would be immediate emigration, which meant, of course, receiving the visa. As I said, it was almost an impossibility. My mother came to Berlin to meet my father, and having had many futile attempts at obtaining a visa, she went to the British consulate, where she met what my father called, my mother, Olea Sholem, called an angel. The British passport officer heard her desperate, heartbreaking story, gave her a single visa entitling my father to enter the UK, and also made a promise that within a matter of weeks, we, the family, would receive visas to follow him. The Nazis kept their promise, allowed my father to leave, but insisted he had to leave within 24 hours, which he did reluctantly, but at the back of our minds, it was only for a matter of weeks. Unfortunately, within two weeks of his departure, the war began, and we, the family, were now trapped in Germany. Life for Jews in Germany had by now become really very, very difficult, unbelievably difficult. We were forbidden to enter any non-Jewish shop. We were permitted to shop in only one shop in town. And if that shop ran short of food, we had to do without. And it happened not infrequently. I have been attending a Jewish school, the only Jewish school in town, and the Nazis forcibly closed it. Any Jewish children attending non-Jewish schools were expelled, so there was no education for any Jewish child after that time. Um, Jews were not allowed to run any business, and any firm, any non-Jewish firm employing Jews was by law compelled to dismiss them. This, of course, had financial implications. People had no panosa. Life was tough. We were not allowed to own a radio. We were not allowed to go to the cinema. We were not allowed to enter any non-Jewish shop, as I mentioned. All civil servants were dismissed. Judges were dismissed. High-ranking army officers who were Jewish, who had distinguished themselves in the First World War and had won medals, none of that counted for anything. They were Jews and had to suffer. With all these difficulties, my mother managed to care for us. She had even attempted to give me some private tuition. She spoke a very good German. She had learned in school. My father had always addressed me in Yiddish and my mother in German. Until some, right at the end of 1941, two brown shirted SA officers came to our apartment and let me just explain when the Nazis built up their huge, powerful army, they created two elite divisions. One was the SS who were the elite, um, to become a member, each member of the SS had to swear allegiance to Hitler. And then there was the brown-shirted SS, SA, um, who became the bully boys for the Nazis. And two of those came to our apartment, told my mother that she had 10 minutes to pack her suitcase. They advised her to take some food and drink, and then we had to accompany them. Well, they marched us to the Central Railway Station in Kassel, 
The Olympic crowd of Jews already assembled, each accompanied by a suitcase. The crowd swelled to around 1,000, and then we were packed into an unheated train, although it was December, and we traveled for three days and three nights. The train stopped, and we soon found out we had been taken to Riga. If the um, technical side works there, can we please look at the first slide? So I won't interrupt my talk if there are problems showing the slide, but we have been taking a distance of around 1,000, no, the, the second one already, um, we have been taking a distance of 1,000 miles. Yeah, this is the slide, Look, Castle is down bottom left, um, Riga is up here with the red arrow. We were, now, as we left the train, we were surrounded by armed guards who formed us into a long column and then walked or marched us into Riga town, through Riga town, into a barbed wire part of Riga town, which was known as the Riga ghetto. They opened the doors of about 40 or so houses, and the 1,000 of us had to crowd into these houses. They were not large houses, and each house was grossly overcrowded. There were more than 20 people allocated to each house. We found many belongings left behind, and almost immediately, I will tell you soon how, we found out that the Riga ghetto had been occupied by 30,000 or so Riga Jews. When the Nazis occupied Riga around mid-1939, within more or less a matter of days, they had erected this fence around that section of Riga and uh, compelled all Riga Jews to leave their homes and rehoused themselves in the ghetto, which was grossly overcrowded. This was around August, towards the end of August, 41. In November of that same year, the Nazis put into operation a devilish plan to massacre all 30,000 of them in order to make room to house the German Jews who were now being deported. They told the lie, they told these Uyghur Jews, that they were being transferred to another camp, lined them up in groups, the Jews believing that they were being walked to another camp. Instead, they walked them into a forest where, using slave labor, they had dug three enormous camps, uh, uh, pits. And as each column of Jews approached, concealed machine guns opened fire and these victims either fell or were thrown into one of these pits, which are still there as mass graves to this day in the Rumbula forest, which is very close to Riga. And we were now housed in the same accommodation that had been vacated by these murdered Riga Jews. When they moved into the ghetto, they were allowed to take things with them, which had all been left behind. Then they were marched thinking to another camp, but in practice to be murdered. We found all these belongings, and until we were told this, of course, we were puzzled. This story was told to us because 30 young Latvian Jews, whose prime uh, requirement was that they were fluent German speakers, were allowed to survive this massacre, and these young Latvian Jews were then appointed as internal camp police in our ghetto. And they told us this story firsthand as eyewitnesses. On our second morning in the ghetto, we were lined up on a sort of morning assembly out in the open. And an SS officer told us that from now on, we have no names any longer. We would each be given a number I can tell you my number today, 56478. And during three and a half years in the camps, I was never ever again called by my name, always by that number. It was important to remember that number because forgetting it, not always, but frequently resulted in punishment, which 
and drag this mend some lashes with a whip. He also told us that any valuables we still possessed had to be handed over in seven days. Otherwise, um, the penalty would be death. They immediately put us on a starvation diet, and he told us that we were forbidden to bring any food back into the camp, because he also told us that all of us up over the age of 13 would be required to work by being marched in groups um, daily out of the ghetto to work in factories, manufacturing things which assisted the German war effort. My mother now had to, <coughs> excuse me, my mother had to walk out to work in one of these groups. I, aged 11, was now in charge of my brother, aged 7. It was not easy for me, nor for any of the other children who were left. And children being children, we sometimes got into trouble. Something remarkable happened that one of the Jews from Kassel in our group had been the teacher at the only Jewish school in town which I had been attending. His name was Habacha, and he was a dedicated gentleman, and it troubled him greatly to see these children abandoned all day and sometimes getting into difficulties, he started pleading with the internal camp administration, which was set up by the Nazis. They selected some Jewish inmates to act as um, a sort of in-camp authority. Nazi orders to us were transmitted via this group. And after much pleading, he was given the use of one room. All the children from the town of Kassel were invited to come to this room daily, where he, without any help, he had no teaching materials, no blackboards, no teaching books, just the knowledge in his mind. He attempted to separate us into groups and teach group by group. It didn't work very well because children were unruly. So he was a very talented person who had musical knowledge, and he formed us into a choir, which meant he could keep everyone's attention from the youngest to, to the oldest simultaneously. And he began teaching us nigunim from our prayers, from our tefillahs, like Adon Alon, Yigdal, would say nigunim from Hallel, and so on. Many of them I still remember, and I still choke when I hear any of them sung in Shu. Well, after my 12th birthday, this gentleman approached me and said, you don't have your father with you, and your bar mitzvah is coming up. Would you like me to teach you? I do not feel embarrassed by telling you that I have really practically no idea what bar mitzvah signified, but being a good boy, I said yes. He began to teach me what he had calculated without aid of, of a calendar, my bar mitzvah Pausha to be, and he began teaching me the Pausha of Tzad, which he had calculated, and he found I was uh, easily absorbing it, so instead of just teaching me sort of one uh, Pausha, he taught me the whole set of uh, Tzad, and what's more, he thought it was uh, Pausha's Torah, so he taught me the additional learning and the half Torah, but there was never a minion and when it came to my Bar Mitzvah Shabbos, miraculously, he had somehow achieved that nine people somehow hadn't gone to work, and I was proud to be counted as number 10, and we made a minion. We even had the Sefer Torah, which had been taken into the camp, possibly by one of the Rabbonim of Riga, when they were forced to live in the camp, and it had been left behind. So we had a Sefer Torah, I learned the whole Pausha, I was called up, and that was the one and only religious service I attended in three and a half years in a number of camps. We had to work seven days a week, there was no Shabbos, no Yom Tov, 
and no food, of course, we were starving 24 hours a day. So time compels me to, to move fairly rapidly. And life went on in this manner. We had one mass selection. Not long after we arrived, about three months after we arrived, we didn't go to work that day. We were taken into a, a large hall and single file. We had to shuffle forward till each one of us stood in front of an SS man who um, just glanced at the person briefly and then either said right or left. People were innocent and didn't realize that that signified life or death. And occasionally, when an elderly person had been pointed in one direction, their children, often adult children, pleaded for the SS man to make an exception and allow them to accompany their parents. Rarely, but very occasionally, he actually granted it. It soon became evident that all the elderly and infirm people were pointed in one direction and the rest in the other. To forestall any possible resistance, the Nazis lied again and told us that this elderly group would be sent to another camp where the work would be um, not as physically difficult. They even told us the camp they were being taken to, they mentioned Dunamunde and said they were being trained to knit fishing nets. Well, Several days later, truckloads of clothing were sent back to the reader ghetto. A group of sorters was ordered to sort this clothing. And in doing so, some of the sorters actually recognized items of clothing which had been worn by their loved ones and they had been sent away that day of the selection. And it became clear to us that like these Latvian Jews, they had been forced to strip and had been murdered, more likely than not the day they were taken. It has since been confirmed. If you look online, you'll see this atrocity actually mentioned. I have found it online as well as remembering it. Well, in August 1943, we were on the morning assembly, uh, kept standing, and around 2,000 of us were selected told we were sent to another camp. They loaded us into cattle trucks. We traveled for two days and nights, of course, um, without any food, water, for sanitation. We had a single bucket. We reached our destination and were taken into a purpose-built labor camp. It was a, an area surrounded by barbed wire and all it contained was wooden barracks. And one of these barracks was the camp kitchen. These barracks contained nothing but three-tier bunk beds, and one of these bunk beds became our home. Some people again had to work in factories, but there was a very busy railway junction, very well, quite close to the camp. And my mother, Valera Sholem, and I, I was 13, but I was set to work. I was considered capable of work. I was became part of a group of around 300 who were marched out each morning to this railway junction to repair bomb-damaged rail trucks. The Allies had realized that this was a vital junction for German military traffic taking supplies to the German war front, and it was regularly bombed to put it out of action. And we were then used to dig up the damaged rails, level the ground, lay new rails to make it serviceable again. The only people who were allowed to stay in the camp during the day was a skeleton staff in the kitchen to prepare some food for us when we came back from work, and four young children of whom my brother was one who were too young to work. One day we returned from work and these children had disappeared. A member of the kitchen staff told us that during that day two SS men had come into the camp and said they had orders to take these children away, and they did so. If your um, PowerPoint system works, then would you please... This was an outline of the Riga ghetto. 
you can see it was quite small and eventually it became grossly, grossly overcrowded for the more than 30,000 Jews packed into this small area. And the next image, please. This is a group being walked to work. It must have been taken by one of the guards and it came into the public domain, so I've included it. And the next one, in addition to um, these mass selections, our guards were keeping an eye on people as they worked during the day. And because of starvation diets, lack of hygiene, and not getting any treatment when people felt unwell, people began to weaken. And if they spotted anyone no longer able to provide a solid day's work, these people were taken aside and either taken or if they walk, didn't walk voluntarily, this is what happened, they were dragged to an execution site where they were shot and their bodies dumped in a mass grave. This happened on a daily basis as against these mass selections which happened fairly infrequently. In August 1943, as I said, these 2,000 of us were packed taken to the next camp. All, all the, the selection happened still in Rio Ghetto. Now we were in a labor camp called Prechu. My mother and I worked on the railways. My brother and three other children remained in the camp. When we came home one day, the children had disappeared. There was no possibility of mourning. I can still hear my mother's wailing at having lost her little boy. But the next morning, we had to go off to work in order to stay alive. In this camp, we had the second selection, similar to what I've just described to you, except that as we entered the hall, we were ordered to strip naked, both men and women. And we then had to shuffle forward single file. As we shuffled forward, the men immediately behind me whispered to me, if he asks you your age, say you're 17. In fact, I was 14. And Incredibly, as though that man had a premonition, Ruach HaKodesh, as I stood in front of the SS officer, he asked me my age. And as he had prompted me, I replied 17. And he pointed me to those destined to survive this selection. My mother, Olea Sholem, who was some distance behind me in the queue, in the lineup, was heartbreakingly pointed in the opposite direction those who were undoubtedly to be murdered that day. We had to leave the hall by different doors and assemble outside, still naked, in our respective groups. Those who had been condemned knew their fate, and quite suddenly a group of them began racing across to join our group, to mingle and get lost in our group in order to save their lives. The guards, of course, stopped it, and began searching for people, dragged some of them back from our group to the condemned side. And I then realized that my mother, Olea Sholem, had been among those who had run across, and she was hiding among us. Fortunately, she was not recognized, and in that manner she managed to save her life. Not only that day, but she was liberated with me. Um, well, nine months after this happened. A week or so later, we were again packed into cattle trucks. And after a similar journey to the first one, we ended up in a concentration camp called Stuttgart. May I have the next slide, please? This, incidentally, is a photo on the left and I, on the right is my brother, the one who was taken away to be murdered. And the next slide, please. After um, all this happened, we did not get our clothes back, but we were given this type of clothing, striped convict uniforms. Each one of us was given one of these uniforms. And from the time we put it on, it did not leave our bodies until the day of our liberation. We worked in it, we slept in it. It was never washed, never changed. And it was quite thin material, 
And the winters in the east were very cold. So not only were we starving, but we were also terribly, terribly cold during the winters. Temperatures reached minus 10, minus 15 more. When we reached the camp of Stuttgart, can I please have the next slide? There's a death gate. This is the main entrance gate to Stuttgart. It was known then and is known to this day as the death gate. Because once you entered Stuttgart, you rarely left alive. Our group of 300 became the envy of the camp when it became known that we were there in transit, we would be sent to another camp. And indeed, three weeks later, we were loaded onto cattle trucks and sent to another camp called Stolp. In this camp, again, we were set to repair railway lines because there was another busy junction close to the camp, which was also being bombed. The, the Allies presumably realized that they could damage the German war effort substantially by concentrating on bombing railways. And it's a possibility that the skill we have acquired working on repairing railway lines for one year in the previous camp helped save our lives in that we left Stuttgart alive. We worked on doing the same work as we had done previously. My main memory of this camp is that Due to hunger, it was difficult to think of anything but where to find a scrap of food to satisfy our hunger pangs. The rumor went around the country, around the camp, that some of the trains which passed through this junction and often stopped for wagons to be uncoupled from one train to be coupled onto another. They sometimes spent hours standing there, and one day a group of inmates broke the seal on a wagon, found some food, and stole it and ate it. In revenge, eight men were arrested, and a couple of weeks later, all of us were forced to stand around the huge gallows which they made the inmates build, and we had to watch these eight men being hanged one by one. Guards would rifle butt us if they caught anyone closing their eyes or looking away. After nearly six months in this camp, we were again, by way of cattle trucks, taken to another much smaller camp called Burggraben. This was quite a small camp, and on the first morning, the usual routine was followed. We had to assemble, and as s -man would ask each one to shout out our number, he would tick a list. And on that first morning, as he approached me, I could see him looking at me repeatedly. I began to be quite scared, because being noticed was not good news as a rule. My mother had always warned me to behave in a manner so I should not be noticed. That was the only good advice she could offer me. She couldn't protect me in any other way. Here he had noticed me. When everyone is dismissed, he said to me, you stay. He came back, looked me up and down, and said, I would be appointed his, I think he used the term Batman, so his, his personal slave. I had to follow him to his accommodation, and he showed me how to polish his boots, brush his uniforms, he had to wash his floor, wash his breakfast things, um, all, all sorts of activity, make his bed, clear up the place, and so on. It, it kept me busy all day long, and he left me to it. I trembled each day, because had I not satisfied him, there was nothing to stop him pulling out his revolver and, and killing me. There would have been no consequence for him. Jewish life was really of no value, whatever. I had to do this for three weeks. That's all the time we spent in this camp. We were rounded up by cattle wagon again, transported. This time we were packed exceptionally tight, no room to sit down. And if anyone fainted or died, which, which did happen, there was no room for anyone to, to be laid down. The pressure of bodies 
made everyone stay upright. After several days of this, the distances we traveled were not very great, but trains stopped. We were not priority traffic. When it was military traffic due to go, we were put into a siding and stopped for hours before we continued our journey. That's why these trips took days. We ended up being taken back to Stuttgart, but this time not in transit, but as inmates. Stuttgart had initially been quite small camp. There were no Jews taken there. It was reserved for German anti-Nazis, non-Jewish, and um, homosexuals, gypsies, and when the war began, uh, Polish partisans, many were shot, but those who weren't shot were sent to Stuttgart. And eventually also prisoners of war began being housed in Stuttgart. In 1943, the camp was extended hugely. The capacity was increased from 8,000 to 25,000. Many new barracks were built and the fence was moved. But by the time we arrived, the number in the camp was almost 50,000, which meant that we had to sleep two in a bunk bed and in some barracks even three. Stutter had to change. Now in retrospect, I realize it was because Germans were beginning to realize that they were losing the war and the German discipline in running the camp was not what it used to be. Some days not everyone got food. It, it, it um, was a very difficult time. And we spent four months in this environment. Um, daily, or nightly I should say, people died in their bunks. And each morning a group was appointed to walk around every bunk, pick up any bodies they found, take them outside, lay them on the ground. And another group of Jews had to push a cart around the camp and pick up these bodies to take them to the crematorium. But what is my most vivid memory is that trainloads of Jews began to arrive in Stuttgart. As the Russians advanced, the Nazis tried to obliterate their atrocities in the eastern camps. And Jews they hadn't managed to murder yet were loaded onto trains and taken back deeper into Germany to camps such as ours and uh, Auschwitz, which had extermination facilities. And in a lottery-like manner, there seemed no logic to it, some train loads were meticulously checked into the camp. They had to face someone sitting at the desk, and the form was filled in for each person before they were allowed into the camp. And other groups were taken straight from the train to the gas chamber and had lost their lives before the day was out. Those checked into the camp, in practice, had been sentenced to a slow death by starvation because the diet by then was really below minimum standard to keep us alive. It was not um, rare to see someone who was just a skeleton shuffle towards the high voltage electric fence surrounding the camp to try and electrocute themselves uh, because they could not bear their suffering any longer. May I have the next slide, please? So this is a, a limited view of the barracks we used to live in. On the right, you see that in addition to a barbed wire fence, um, there were also tower, watch towers with armed guards on them. And frequently, these armed guards would shoot the poor person who attempted to electrocute themselves because we weren't allowed to approach that wire. So sometimes, they lost their lives by a shot instead of through electrocution. And the next slide, please. Here you see an image of the crematorium ovens. If you go 
to Stuttgart now, you'll see some of these ovens in the crematorium which survived. And the next slide, please. So, on the left, you'll see the appearance of a person such uh, as the shuffling towards the fence to electrocute themselves, quite literally bone and skin. On the right, you catch a glimpse of what I called the execution site earlier when I said when people lost their strength, they were taken to one of these sites and were murdered. These photographs, of course, must have been taken by the SS themselves and somehow came into the public domain um, after the war. So, in Stuttgart, that was daily life and we somehow managed to survive it for four months. We arrived in Stuttgart towards the end of uh, December and lived in that manner, both my mother and I, miraculously, were still alive then. We were not together. There was a men's camp and a ladies' camp. The ladies was next to the men's camp, but separated by a barbed wire fence. May I have the next slide, please? Now, I included this because I'm actually hoping that it will stun you. When we talk about millions of victims, it is an abstract figure. This is an enormous mound of shoes. This photograph, I believe, was taken in Stuttgart by a Russian soldier when the camp was liberated. And this originated because when people were taken to the gas chamber, they had to take off their shoes before entering. And this is the amount of shoes that grew. Just imagine each pair of these shoes represents a human being who lost their life in the gas chamber. That perhaps to bring some sort of understanding into the numbers involved. And please remember that Stuttgart was a fraction of the size of Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, you could have had eight or ten of these mounds of shoes to represent people who were murdered. The next uh, slide is just a letter sent by an SS man proudly telling his superiors how many kilos of hair had been collected because when people were marched into the gas chamber, if they spotted any young lady with beautiful long hair, she was taken aside, had her hair shaved off, and this letter tells his superiors that, as you see down below, it was disinfected and um, it would be sent back to Germany to be made into weeks for Germans. That, that was our life. Towards the end of April, on the 26th of April, one morning, around 5,000 of us were selected and we were lined up in a long line, both men and women. My mother didn't know whether I was among those selected, and I didn't know whether she was included, but men and women had to line up. We were each given a chunk of bread and escorted by SS guards, we were marched out of the camp of Stuttgart. We marched for hours until we reached a port, a small port, and there were four barges lined up. They loaded the 5,000 of us, but I, I ought to tell you that during that march, anyone who did not have the strength to keep pace, and the pace of the march was set by these healthy SS guards who had plenty of strength, and it was a fair speed to be marched up, anyone trailing behind was shot by the guards. And we lost quite a number of people on our first morning marching to these barges. They loaded us into these four barges. Four tanks turned up, which were manned by SS groups. And these uh, tanks towed, each one towed one barge out to sea. After a while, our convoy stopped, and SS man appeared at the top of our barge, which was of an open-bodied boat. 
the interior was completely open, the salt you might use to transport coal or maybe wheat. And we were right at the bottom of the barge, one thousand of us packed in there. We each had to sit with our legs wide apart so the next person could sit between our legs. There was no room to lie down. Each person had to lean in a sitting position against the one behind. And we were locked in this position for six days. There were no sanitary facilities on board, no food apart from the chunk of bread, and no drink during those six days. Mrs. Esman stood at the top, glanced down, he ordered some men to follow his orders, and apparently randomly, he would select one person, pointed at them, and he knew which one he wanted, he was specific. That person had to be dragged up on deck, and then we heard a splash. They were thrown into the sea at his orders to be drowned. He repeated this until he was satisfied and then went off. And the convoy continued. This gruesome spectacle continued every day for six days. And each of these days, around 25 to 30 victims lost their lives. I have never in my life wanted anything as much at during those times to become invisible because it was random, like a lottery, whoever he pointed at was dead the moment he pointed at this person. Periodically, these tugs would uncouple themselves and go off for a few hours. We thought to refuel. On day six, they likewise went off and didn't return. After several hours, a group of prisoners of war who were part of our 1,000 on our barge. What I found out later that these prisoners of war in Stutthof actually had a much better diet fed to them. I didn't know at the time, but I've since found out that Jews got the worst diet and the prisoners of war got the best diet of, of three different diets. They still have some courage and strength and the will to live. They clambered on top deck, they prized loose some planks and formed themselves into a rowing team because we were not too far from land. We could see land, but we were probably half a kilometer or so from land. And they attempted to row this boat of around 1,000 in, loaded into it towards shore. We didn't see any of this, but um, reports kept coming back. Eventually, miraculously, we were told that the boat actually moved ever, ever so slowly, that they rode for hours and then they were exhausted, other people took their place. They rode all day long into the night and through the night. And shortly before daybreak, the barge ran aground, still a short distance from the shore. Anyone who had an ounce of strength clambered up into the water on land, walked or sort of shuffled to land. It was a pitch dark night. There was no sign of any habitation. And people didn't know what, what next, which way was it safe to run. And while we were sort of debating what next, these SS tugs returned. And they, of course, were livid at what they saw. They divided into two groups, one boarded the barge, and everyone who had not jumped as we had was murdered, was shot. We could hear incessant shooting on the barge. The second group came ashore, rounded us up, and we thought our last moment had come. But no, they um, lined us up in a long column and marched us into a small town they were taken into a German compound. It was a, a naval, naval training school. We had to stand to attention for hours while presumably they debated what next. After some hours, they came back. Of course, we had been under guard all this time. And we were marched out onto a road, marched for several hours again. Many people lost their lives by just not having any strength to keep up. And as soon as you trailed behind, mercilessly, 
He had a shot in the back of the head and the body was just left by the roadside. He lost many people on that last march. Military traffic passed by, but that was no interest to us. It didn't help us. Eventually, we saw a tank column in the distance coming towards us. And as it came closer, suddenly people began shouting, look, look, our guards have gone. And indeed, suddenly, instead of killing Jews who were trailing behind the column, these SS guards suddenly turned and ran for their lives. They had, they had spotted before we did that this was a British tank column and had run away. Of course, we were now free. Elated, we kept shouting, we're free, we're free. We didn't know what to do next. But soon after, truckloads of British soldiers appeared who began caring for us. And that was the moment of our liberation. Those tanks had not come to liberate us. They had by chance chosen the same route as we were marching on to travel to their next objective. And just by passing us, they had scared our guards into running away and thereby liberated us. It was a miracle, pure chance that they came in sight of the guards and we were now free. Well, I'm running out of time. Um, we spent time in hospital, I was sent to a convalescent home. I was interviewed by a welfare officer, my mother and I, and asked that we had any relatives anywhere in the world. He gave what sparse details we had of my father. And my father in London um, was given an opportunity. The chief rabbi opened an office for refugees like my father to give details of family they were searching for. For six long years, of course, my father had no idea of the fate of his family. That must have been one unbroken six-year-long agony. It took several months, but they managed to match the, the two descriptions, and my father was told that part of his family had survived. He applied for us to join him. It took until September 46 before we received visas. Many um, survivors, of course, wanted to go to Palestine, which the British wouldn't permit, but um, that there was um, sort of an underground network. And every so often, someone from our convalescent home would disappear overnight, have been picked up and taken illegally, of course, onto a boat in Italy and traveled illegally to Palestine. Some managed to get through the blockade of the British, some were caught and were interned, but that they did make it, we made it to England. Um, my parents deprived themselves of many things to give me an opportunity because my father was a pauper. He'd served in the army for some years, and then because he was Shema Shabbos, he had to take a, a very low grade job in order not to work on Shabbos. There was a, a from building firm who were refurbishing bomb damaged homes to allow the owners to live in them again. And my father applied to become a painter. He had never held a paintbrush in his life, he told me. But it wasn't high-grade work. They were very short of people because the able-bodied man was in the army. So they accepted him. And he just played a bit dumb, followed whatever the other painters were doing. He copied. And he managed to keep that job till the end of the war, which enabled him to be Shoyma Shabbos. But he earned a pittance. So when we arrived, my father literally was a pauper. Nevertheless, primarily at my mother, Olea Sholem's insistence, they enrolled me for some private tuition. I attended three terms, and then I felt too um, guilty to continue doing it. I took some dead end jobs, I started becoming an electrician. But eventually, um, I decided I wanted to study, so I wanted to exercise 
my mind sort of uh, into more than being an electrician. Um, it took years, but eventually I graduated from London University with a Bachelor of Science degree in what would now be called electronics. Then it was called light electrical engineering. I eventually, many years later, I think time stops me from telling you how I met my wonderful wife, Shari, who I expect a number of you will know. I still bless the day her Kurdish who led me to her. And I'm still happy to this day that she said yes first time I asked. I began leading a normal life. Thank God I did not have nightmares. I have a positive temperament. She had children and I never visited any of the camps I had been incarcerated in, nor did I um, so, um, let this be a burden on me for life. I tried to bring up our children with a normal life, which I hope I succeeded. But eventually, 72 years later, in 1917, I was contacted by the Holocaust Educational Trust and told that Prince William and Princess Kate were paying a visit to a concentration camp of Stuttgart. Um, I'll, I'll explain these photos in a moment. Um, they were making a trip to Germany and at their initiative, they wanted to visit a concentration camp. Stuttgart happened to be only 30 miles off their intended itinerary and that therefore it was chosen. And they then expressed a wish to meet some survivors. So a friend and I who both were in Stuttgart as youngsters, you see him in the background there. Um, on the left photograph, there's the princess and I in the foreground. And between the princess and me is my friend Ziggy and the tall person is Prince William. The building you see behind is the crematorium. You see the long chimney on the left. The royal couple walked through the camp, which was now an exhibition. We were able to explain things to them, which puzzled them. And of course, they asked us pertinent questions also what happened to us prior to coming to Stuttgart. They, they learned a lot that day. And it caused unbelievable publicity. As a result of this publicity, I made contact with the son of a, another survivor who his son told me that his father died when he was two years old and he knows nothing about his father's background. He actually came to London to hear me speak on Tishabath in a shul in order to hear my story. And two of the camps I was in, this story would apply to his father as well. So, Thank God, our lovely family is my revenge on the Nazis. So Hashem, we have four sons, probably known to some of my listeners here tonight, David, Tzvi, Arya, and Rafi. All four of them are showing the shadows. And thank God, the Almighty has been kind to us. I have had a, a, a wonderful life. I've had to curtail a lot of things. When I came to England, I learned English in a crash course in a Jewish school in Stoke Newington called the Avita School. Um, the headmaster, headmaster and his headmistress, Dr. Levine and Dr. Grunfeld, um, sized up my background and arranged for two teachers, a Rav and a secular teacher, to take me under their wing. And it is at least partly because of the tuition in Jewish life I was given by the Rav, um, Rabbi Yisrael Levi, no, Rabbi Yisrael Cohen Halevi, um, that I am what I am today. And the secular teacher, who also taught me not only secular subjects, but also Jewish um, 
knowledge was Mr. Rosenthal. He was also a teacher in that school. To both these gentlemen, I am deeply, deeply indebted. And my time is more than up. I'm afraid I'll have to stop now to give you a chance to ask me questions. If anything I've said puzzles you, or you would like to know anything I have not mentioned, feel free to question me. Thank you so much for listening to me. Mr. Goldberg, thank you very, very much. I think we all feel privileged to have heard you. And uh, I think if I would have known that you, you felt short of time, I'm sure I'll speak on behalf of all 267 participants currently on this Zoom, they would have been happy to hear you go on all night. So thank you. It's an enormous privilege. I will take questions. I might just exercise my chairman's privilege and ask you the first, if I may, so everybody can compose themselves and think of some suitable questions for you. But in the meanwhile, one of the, one of the, I have many questions for you, but I'll limit myself to one. What was it like for your parents after they were reunited? Did they discuss what each of them had been through vis-a-vis -vis your father's what must have been meant, you know, tremendous mental anguish and your mother's um, you know, torture in the concentration camps, or did they sort of move that aside and try and lead a normal life? What was it like between your parents after the war? Sorry, you're on mute, Mr. Goldberg. Sorry, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Um, the reunion with my father, Oliver Sherwin, was tremendous, but it was a bittersweet reunion because my younger brother was missing. And my parents, although they were wonderful people, um, I think the experiences damaged both of them in some way, that they lived together, but it was no longer a blissful marriage, which I believe it had been earlier. Um, neither of them could bring themselves to speak of what had happened. I certainly couldn't. My memories were clear, but they were locked inside me for decades before I actually managed to break out and gave a talk in our shul that was not until past the last millennium, in the 2000s, this, the early 2000s, this happened. Until then, the memories were clear within me, but I could not speak about them. Likewise, both my parents, as I told you, lived in Poland. All their family, parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, nephews, nieces, they all remained behind. They were all, without exception, rounded up and murdered. Of all our close family, none in Poland survived. We have not found anyone. We searched for my brother for many years and found no evidence as to his fate. But it took me many, many years to accept that he perished, probably the day he was taken from us. But I lived in hopes every few years I would read of a miraculous the union of brothers or a mother found a son and I thought well miracles do happen why, why shouldn't my brother have been one of those miraculous survivors and I could not bring myself to say a cabbage for my father my brother for many many years I lived in hopes initially high hopes it began to fade but never faded completely it, it was extraordinary I just could not bring myself to accept it I do now um, so my parents lived together but never spoke. In fact, I know very little about my family in Poland because my parents could never bring themselves to speak of family. And I foolishly was not insistent enough to make them. I regret it now, but I, I didn't. So I couldn't speak about my experiences and my parents could not really gel in, in, in a normal, into a normal life. My mother was extremely hospitable and they, over the years that they, they acquired a lovely circle of friends. 
but I will tell you something which is quite upset and it, it um, hurt me and Shari, my wife, was heartbroken. When my mother, Olea Sholem, died, unfortunately, 10 weeks before my chasen, before my wedding, she lived to meet Shari and she attended our engagement, but she was not fated to see any grandchildren. Um, when my father became a widower, one by one, our close friends, so-called close friends, melted away. And my father became quite a lonely man. He no longer fitted into a circle as a single person, but mainly couples they had befriended. And it was a very, very cruel thing to do. I realized at the time, and even more so now, and Shari was heartbroken. To this day, she cannot forgive some people for this attitude. And that, unfortunately, was a um, price of, of the tortures we had to undergo. I, I, I hope that my talk has given you some insight, some understanding of what actually transpired in these camps. Don't forget that you heard only one story, that, that there were millions of these, and unfortunately many millions are not able to tell you their story. I hope I've sort of answered your question. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Um, I will take further questions if anybody has. I think the best thing to do is just unmute yourself and speak first. Otherwise, I will have one more go. If I okay. There's often a lull before the first question is asked, and then it kind of turns into a torrent. Yeah. Is there anybody? I, I don't have a question, but I'd just like to make a comment to say I think this is so humbling. We feel we're going through such difficult times now, which I, which we actually are. But I think this really brings, I don't know, you've spoken of it, you said yourself, for millions who can't speak for themselves, and I think this really brings humbles us to know that we perhaps just stop fetching when we hear what you went through and how you mm. and survived and the koyach i think it's given us all i really feel it's given me koyach in any case to sort of to feel that we can get through things and we can survive i thank you so so much and wish you and shari really simcha in the finachas in the future thank you thank you madam anyone could else I, could i ask please um <coughs> it's not intrusive how did you take up this whole topic with your own children? How did you address it with them? Sorry, how did I what? Address your your own history with your children. Mm. Were you a person who you know, didn't talk about it? Or were you able to discuss it openly with them? No, my, my children knew my background and knew sort of what happened, but it, it was unbelievable. But I could not go into any details. I told them I was in a number of camps and it gave um, vague descriptions of, of what happened, but I could not bring myself to recount my story as I did tonight. It, it, it just was impossible for me. I told you, I spoke to our shul, the Hendon Adas, about 16 years ago, I think, and that was my very first public talk. I have been asked many, many times because there's an annual event at Grand Tishabar and they also always ask the survivor to tell their story. The organizer of this event in our shul was a good friend of mine, Leo Vida, and he asked me year after year after year, and I always said no. And it was only because my family began to work on me. Uh, Shari, who always left me to make my own decisions, but in this case, she also began telling me that I was wrong to refuse. Actually, Rabbi Kimcha also had a hand in it because he um, spoke to me informally and told me that many Jewish youngsters had very little idea of what the Holocaust was about and it would be highly educational for them if I could bring myself to speak about my experiences. So all these things combined made me once in a hasty moment say yes when I was asked. I regretted it, but once I'd given my answer, that was it. And that's how I began speaking. 
once I'd given my first talk, of course, I was overwhelmed with requests to speak elsewhere. And so it snowballed. And before long, um, I was approached by the Holocaust Educational Trust. They put me on their um, speaker's uh, rota. And then I began speaking to schools, universities, adult groups as well, some organizations, um, large organizations, like for instance, um, last week I spoke to Barclays Bank. Uh, I've spoken to HSBC Bank at their headquarters in Canary Wharf and to the Royal Bank of Scotland. And both these banks told me that my talk would be video recorded and would be made available to all the 250,000 employees worldwide. They would not be compelled to listen to it, but anyone who fancied it at any time could log in and listen to my talk. So some uh, firms do um, take Holocaust education seriously. They, they relayed, these banks relayed the talk to many of their branches in five different countries, which I saw on screen, plus, as I said, all their employees. I've spoken to quite a number of ministries. I think I mentioned the Bank of England. Every government ministry, last week I spoke to a government ministry, the, the, the Ministry of um, Business, Innovations and Skills, I think they're called. Um, so the Holocaust remembrance has taken root. The Educational Trust tells me that on Holocaust Remembrance Day, just on that one day, there are more than 10,000 gatherings all over the country from groups, the vast majority of them, of course, non-Jewish, who have their own way of commemorating the Holocaust. There's a, a growing group of non-Jewish youngsters who nowadays um, commit themselves to um, making sure that the Holocaust is not forgotten, even when the last survivor has reached the Olympo MS. Um, they are called ambassadors, and they actually speak to groups. They have all been educated. The government actually subsidizes a program which is run by the Educational Trust called Lessons from Auschwitz. And the government subsidy enables them, or has enabled them so far to take 40,000 teachers plus thousands of six formers to Auschwitz, usually in groups of around 200, accompanied by educationalists. And the, they're in Auschwitz, I think, and, and surroundings, only for, they visit some Polish towns as well. They're there only, I think, for a day and a half. But they spend days being debriefed deep, and listening to um, talks. And that they're really educated. And these teachers, from then on, from that experience, know what they're talking about. They can teach their pupils part of the, um, holo the Holocaust remembrance is part of the curriculum. And these teachers teach mainly six formers um, and now speak from the heart rather than from a textbook. So over a period of years, this has been a, a, made a major impact. I've asked, been asked to speak in some schools as a result of a teacher having gone to Auschwitz. And in some cases, they've heard in a, a talk from me similar to the way I spoke to you today as part of their induction before they went to Auschwitz. And some teachers remembered that my talk was powerful to them and have asked me as a result to come and speak in their school after they had returned from, from their trip to Auschwitz. And so, Bert, I'm going to have to, to wrap it up, but I, 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 there is a question in the chat, which I do feel duty bound to, to, to pass on, because I'm sure it's a question that most of us have, and uh, it's uh, stated by David Goodman, who said, and I quote him, it is humbling to hear you speak. You sound as if you retained your belief in Hashem throughout. How? Um, so that will be the final question of the evening.
but I think it's a question that that is worth asking you for your answer will be worth well, hearing. Well, it, it took me time to find the courage to answer it, but I will answer it honestly. Some of you may be surprised. When I came to this country, I must tell you, first of all, um, I was a little boy attending the Jewish school in Germany, in Kassel. I was eight and a half when the school was closed down. I'd had no further education, Jewish or secular, until I reached England, age 16. I was now a strapping youngster, 16 years old, but educationally, I was a little boy of eight or nine years. Well, my father, Oliver Shalom, despite all the trauma he underwent, had not lost his faith. He, as I told you, he spent years in the yeshiva. He had payers behind his ears when he was a youngster, not when I knew him. But he, he was a learned man. He attended Shirim. Um, he he dabbled in Grove Lane Shul. He was a devout follower of Rav Rabinov, one of the Gdoyle in Ador. Um, he had not lost his faith. And when we finally met up, um, he, of course, expected me to follow in his footsteps. Um, I did. But it was fairly meaningless to me. I had practically no knowledge. I went to start going to shul with him, and um, I, I, I did everything I was asked to do. I could read Hebrew, but that's about it. I had no understanding of any of the fillers. Um, so I was outwardly an observant Jew. I, I wore a kippah, like my father did, but Inwardly, I was in turmoil because once I began understanding our prayers, I realized that we think of the Almighty as um, a just and merciful God. And I could not square that with my personal experiences. How could such a God allow such things to happen to me? And I, I, I just couldn't match up these two things. And therefore, uh, I was not a truly believing from Jew. As I began to mature, I began to realize that, in fact, if you keep our eyes open, and not everyone does, it become, soon becomes apparent that we are facing or experiencing miracles daily the miracle of birth, the miracle of the human body, of our digestion, of the seasons, of food growing out of the ground, or of the sun being just the right distance from Earth. Any closer we'd be burnt, any further away we'd be frozen to death. That there are hundreds of, of, of these things we can, with thought, uh, visualize. And it became clear to me that there had to be a creator, an almighty being, who created and runs this world. And once I had established that to my satisfaction, um, I was still troubled. How could such a, a god um, do these things? On the one hand, do everything possible for us I've been breathing for 90 years, Be'ezus Hashem, without being aware of it. If that isn't a miracle, I don't know what is. The blood circulating in our bodies, picking up oxygen each time it floats, flow, flows around. But, but there are many such things. And eventually, I came to my senses, and I, as I began reading through the Chumash, in, uh, eventually, I came across um, an utterance of Moshe Rabbeinu. I will hear it, Moshe Rabbeinu. He, he was the person who was in all humanity, in all history, who came closest to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And yet, the Chumash mentions that at one point, he pleaded with HaKadosh Baruch Hu to give him 
some understanding of the Almighty. And the Kurdish Baruch's response was, my ways are not your ways. And that gave me to understand that the Kurdish Baruch Hu is infinite. And we, after all, are finite beings. And if we are unable or incapable of understanding, and I don't know any, I've not come across to give me any understanding, I began to accept that if we do not comprehend it is and this, I did with taking that on board, I began to change totally and become a believer, and I have lived my life as a faithful believing Jew ever since. But it took me years to do it. I don't know whether my parents ever became aware of it, um, because I did not openly discuss it. This was internal turmoil which brought me to this point in my life. But it did so sincerely and genuinely. And here, I, I guess that all of you, that some of my audience will have known me for many years and will think this is the person who grew up like this normally, but he did not. But there was a time when I had deep doubts and just could not bring myself to, to reconcile these two experiences. I have much to thank these two teachers, Mr. Rosenthal and Rabbi um, Yisroel Cohen. And equally, I'm deeply indebted to these two headmasters who engineered that these two teachers would contact me and offer me with this free tuition. I used to go around every Shabbos afternoon to Rabbi Cohen, who lived just around the corner from us. We were in Kaysenot Road in Stanford Hill, and he lived in Alcan Road, not, not more than three minutes walk from my home. I used to spend hours with him Shabbos afternoon, and he would gently initiate me into Yiddish Kai. And Mr. Rosenthal, I spent time in his house, and he would speak to me both about secular and, of course, uh, Jewish subjects. He was a, a learned person, despite being a secular teacher. And he would give me books to read, which were suitable for my level of knowledge. When I'd read them, I would go to his house, we would discuss the books, and he would give me the next book. So both these gentlemen have had material input into shaping me into the person I am now. And one more thing I want to mention, and that is that not a little, but quite a lot of credit is due to my wonderful wife. She saw something in me when she met me. I mean, I, it was not immediately after. I, I was already um, mature, grown up. I had studied, I had taken a degree, but I was still not the person I am today. And she certainly helped shape me in, in some adult life and deserves my credit, which I do give her. I don't usually do it publicly, but I've decided to embarrass her by mentioning it here. Lovely. Thank you very much. It, it, it may have private repercussions once we switch off. <laughs> <laughs> we don't always listen to our wives. Mr. Goldberg, it's been a huge, huge privilege, I'm sure, for everybody who's heard you tonight. Um, I personally wish you only, you and Mrs. Goldberg, Mazel Brocha and Hatzlacha. I will pass on the mic to Rabbi Zobin to speak on behalf of us all and conclude the evening. But my thanks to you, Mr. Goldberg. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me so respectfully and to you personally for your able chairmanship of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alon. And uh, Mr. Goldberg, no words. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences, uh, the losses you suffered, um, the memories you collect, and the, the cruelty and also the miracles for which you are, of which you are an eyewitness. Um, 
the, the deaths, the painful losses, obviously in particular your younger brother Herman, the cold, the hunger, um, the scenes you witnessed at the start of the Holocaust and the, uh, the ghetto and the camps that followed, all at such a tender and young age. Um, and, and just to hear what was a short synopsis of, of really an, an endless story on and on, one stage after another. And just when we think, how can it get worse? How, how could you go on? And yet go on, you did. And it's really so important for us to, to hear you speak about what you saw and what you experienced. And I, I think I speak on behalf of all of us when I thank you for the clarity with which you shared this. Um, thank you not just for your, your time and energy this evening, but also your bravery, um, your strength in unlocking these memories, as you said, and sharing your story with us and with so many others. I'm really only slowly starting to reflect and process what you shared. Um, I stand in awe of you and your parents, your ability post-war to rebuild your life, um, to achieve an education, marriage, work, Yiddishkeit, um, and obviously most preciously to build your, your beautiful family. You know, of course, as I was a schoolmate with your, your Rafi. Um, I think we all salute you and um, to hear you speak with such wisdom and depth about your, your journey in Emona and Betochen and your ability to, to build a home of Torah and health and love. Um, it's humbling, it's inspiring, um, it's quite frankly amazing and, and remarkable. Um, I know how, how proudly you are and rightly so of your family and I know how proud they are of you. To thank, thank you so much for sharing your story, for honoring the community by, by so doing. Um, you're an inspiration to us all, your strength and your courage and your wisdom. Um, the numbers that joined this evening are really a testimony uh, to how much we all need and wanted to hear your story. Um, so just to conclude on behalf of all of us, really thank you again. And also I just want to offer the tefillah, may HaKadosh Baruch grant you and uh, Mrs. Goldberg continue health and nachas from all your lovely family. And may mean, we know no more Taurus. Amen and thank you. Amen. 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 Can you hear us? Right.